Good afternoon, Redemption Hill Church. I'm Joshua, if we have not met, and hello, it is. Uh, I, I hope to get to meet you properly at some point. <laughs> you, you know, friends, th- this, this whole encounters with Jesus thing, uh, in, in many ways, it's at the very heart of our religion, isn't it? We gather around this Jesus because we gather to hear the good news of what he has done for sinners. I I want to acknowledge that what we just heard from Jacob and Simon might be shocking news for for many of us, especially if you're here and you're visiting for the first time or you're not a Christian. It might be a lot to take in. I, I want to acknowledge that. I assure you this is not what happens every week. It's not what happens many weeks. In fact, it's pretty much the only time it has happened through all of Redemption Hill's history. But I will also assure you that if you come on any given week, you will hear good news. Good news about this Jesus Christ because that is what all of God's Word is about. This Word that we gather around, it is the good news of our God to His needful people. So join me. Open your Bibles to John chapter 3 and I will read for us from verses 1 through to 21. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit, do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of men be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved Through him, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not Come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Redemption Hill Church, these are the true words of the living God. Thanks be to God. Help us to respond in faith. Will you join me as we go to God for a word of prayer? Our gracious Heavenly Father, it is in your light that we see light. With you is the fountain of life, and we thirst. So we ask that in this time, by the power of your Spirit, you would point us to the Jesus Christ, 
who has come that we might never thirst again. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Church, we are in this series where, as I mentioned earlier, Jesus meets persons of every type. Last week, we saw Jesus meeting the rich, and all the way through to Easter, we will see Jesus meeting the doubting. Today, we see Jesus meeting the religious. But why, why does this matter? Well, you may be surprised, but this matters because we live in an increasingly religious world. Yes, increasingly, meaning more and more religious. The Washington Post published an article in 2015 explaining findings from the Pew Research Center. Do you know that more than 85% of the world is projected to be religiously affiliated by 2050? It's increasing, not decreasing. This might be surprising to some of us today because there is a certain narrative, there has been a certain narrative that is culture progresses and modernization and uh, growth and, and all of these things um, will just bring about more and more secularization and unbelief. The singer John Lennon uh, stated quite clearly in 1966, he, he said this, 1966, Christianity will go, it will vanish and shrink. I needn't argue with that. I'm right and will be proved right. Well, that's really not what we're seeing. It's the opposite. Modern sociologists, they tell us that people want and need religion for a variety of reasons. And in many ways, I'm preaching to the choir because we are all here for a religious service. But it does make one curious, doesn't it? I'm curious, what's the purpose of your religion? Or more pointedly, what is the purpose of your Christian religion? Or most importantly, do you know what your Jesus, from whom Christianity flows, thinks about your Christian religion? Well, our text is here to help us with that. Look with me to the text. We see Jesus meeting a very, very religious man, not just an ordinarily religious man, but a man named Nicodemus of the Pharisees. If you're familiar with the Pharisees, they were the religious elite of the day. And Nicodemus, he was the elite of the elite. And we read that he was a ruler of the Jews, which meant that he was part of the Sanhedrin, which was the ruling religious council. They had real authority. And these guys, they were so hardcore about keeping to their religious observance. I'll give you an example. If you were here last week, you would have heard Jacob Abraham talk about tithing, where 10% of whatever you, you have is given unto the Lord. Uh, this is taken from the Old Testament. So if you were an Israelite living uh, more than 2,000 years ago, if you had a large grain harvest, you would take a tenth of it and you would tithe it at the temple. These Pharisees were so serious that they literally tithed everything they had. It is recorded for us that they tithed their garden herbs. You know those little things you grew in your windowsill during the pandemic? Your mint, your uh, cumin, your w w whatever that might be. They, they, they took that and, and they tithed it. Imagine coming to church with that. Uh, thankfully, we've moved to electronic giving, so you can't get any funny ideas. But, but, but the point of all of this is that Nicodemus was a very, very religious man and one of much power who was held in high regard. How would someone like that approach Jesus? Sincerely. And that's what the text tells us. He approaches Jesus with sincerity. You notice that he calls Jesus rabbi. By human standards, this is an incredible show of respect. Rabbis had to be formally trained and ordained, sort of like getting a PhD. Well, this is sort of like someone with a PhD coming to a Jesus who's uncredentialed and calling him rabbi. Quite incredible. And he, he even goes further to share a complimentary assessment of Jesus. You are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now that's not just respectful. That's bold. Because by this time, Jesus was already attracting heat from the religious authorities of the day. If you read one chapter earlier in John chapter 2, you'll see that this was the Jesus flipping tables at the temple. He was not a stranger to controversy. And that probably explains why Nicodemus came to Jesus at night, away from the crowds, away from the searching eyes of the powers that be. 
And so this religious man comes. Sincere, respectful, seeking. What does Jesus have to say to a sincere, respectful seeker? What does Jesus have to say to the religious? Two things. First thing, you must be born again. And the second thing, you must believe in me. Let's think about that together. Uh, We'll start with the first. And Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. How's that for an opening exchange? Nicodemus comes paying compliments and Jesus turns it up from a zero all the way to a hundred. Do you see that happening here? Friends, this might not be the way you and I normally engage in conversation, but, but there is something instructive here, you know. There is something instructive here about what it means to encounter Jesus because he does this all the time. Friends, when we encounter Jesus, he is bound to move the meeting exactly into what we need, which is often very different from what we want. You see, Nicodemus thought that his religious status reflected his standing in the kingdom of God. He's a religious ruler, so he comes, he makes an assessment of this Jesus in God's kingdom, even a complimentary assessment. But that's the wrong way to relate to Jesus. For Jesus is the king of the kingdom. Nicodemus wasn't addressing an equal. He was coming before his king. Even then, do you see that Jesus' response is not a harsh response of rebuke? It's not even the angry or petty response of someone who feels disrespected. He he doesn't respond by telling Nicodemus, you called me rabbi, you should be calling me your king. He doesn't do that. Why is that the case? Friends, it's like this because Jesus is not like the kings of our earthly kingdoms. He's not like the powers that you and I know. He's far more concerned about what he's here to do for us. He isn't just here for more affection and respect. He's far more concerned about what he's here to do for you. He's the only king who came as a servant. Who is a king like him? And this is why he stresses, you must be born again. For that's what he has come to do. He has come to bring about a new birth. Some people hear the words born again and you think that it's something similar to, I don't know, a a fresh start, a second chance, a pop artist re-releasing her music on her own terms, maybe something like that, Uh, someone coming out of a midlife crisis, learning from the mistakes of his past, reinventing himself. Uh, That's not being born again. That's really just learning from your past and striving on to the future. That's not what the Bible means. What the Bible means by being born again is to be entirely dependent on another's work. This idea of complete dependence is even intuitive to the phrase, isn't it? Think with me, think with me. What do babies contribute to their birth? I, I, I have a friend, uh, I, I know someone who's called well, we just call him Jimmy. And this Jimmy, he's almost allergic to celebrating birthdays. Whenever his birthday comes around, Jimmy is bound to say, guys, guys, you really don't have to celebrate my birthday. Think about it. What did I do on my birthday? All I did was get spanked on my behind and cry. <laughs> that, that's really all of my contribution to my birthday. If you want to celebrate someone, celebrate my mom. She did all of the work. Well, I I don't know what you think of birthdays, but whatever you think, there there is some truth to this idea, isn't there? To be born again is to be entirely dependent on another's work. And to be specific, God's work. What work is this? It's the sort of work that makes dead hearts come alive. And that's the same idea that Jesus repeats in verse 5. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, and it draws from the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel, through whom God had promised, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uh, your uncleanness. And from all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart 
and a new spirit I will put within you. Do you see whose action is in focus here? It's God's action. He will sprinkle and cleanse. He will give a new heart. He will bring forth new birth. Nicodemus, whatever your religious standing and understanding, whatever the the measure of it, this is what you truly need. For until God causes you to be born again, you cannot even see the kingdom of God. These are heavy words. I know that some of you might be thinking, well, okay, uh, a new heart is good. A new heart is good. But what's so wrong with my old heart? Upgrades? Sure. But a total revamp? Is that really necessary? Friends, it is. We need a completely new heart. Because when we are left to ourselves, our hearts are always firmly set on loving the wrong things. The Christian religion talks about sin in a number of different ways, and one way that I found very helpful is from a guy named Augustine who lived in the 4th century. Uh, Augustine famously said that the essence, the essence of our sinful hearts is disordered love. The essence of our sinful hearts is disordered love. Uh, Let let me explain it, and I paraphrase a commentator here. Uh, When when Augustine was a young man, just 19 years of age, mind you, he, he read an observation from a Roman philosopher named Cicero, and Cicero said, every person sets out to be happy, but the majority are thoroughly wretched. This observation was true in the 4th century. I put it to you, it's true also in the 21st century. There isn't a single child on earth who grows up dreaming and dreaming and dreaming that he will one day be miserable. Yet, many people's lives end up being characterized by this sort of insecurity, dissatisfaction, brokenness. I'm sure you know someone like that. Maybe you see parts of it in yourself also. Why does this happen? Why does this keep on happening? Augustine's answer, our lives are out of order because we have disordered loves. Let let me give you some examples. Uh, All of us in this room would say that we know it is a good thing to be kind and generous. We may even love the idea of being kind and generous people, but we aren't as completely kind and generous as we should be. Why? Because we love our comforts more. We know it's a good thing to be forgiving. We even love the idea of forgiving persons, especially when we need another's forgiveness. But we aren't as completely forgiving as we should be because we love our rights more. And friends, especially my religious friends, we know we should be better. We know we should be better For once we know that we are not simply held to account by our own standards, but the holy God's standards, we know we should be better. Yet we aren't as good as we should be. Why? For at the end of the day, we are so in love with our own ways over any true and lasting love for God. That's the natural slant of sinful hearts. And this is Augustine's diagnosis. The essence of it is a disordered love. Do you know what this means? It means that until God transforms your heart, you will not love Him rightly. If you don't love Him rightly, you will not love His ways rightly. And if you don't love His ways rightly, you won't love people rightly. So if we don't love Him his ways, and each other rightly, friends, we stand in rebellion against him. And rebels don't belong in his kingdom under his care. Rebels who persist in their rebellion belong outside of his kingdom, under his wrath. So the first thing that you and I need is for God to come and transform our rebellious hearts. 
we must not marvel that Jesus says, you must be born again. We need it. And that's exactly what he came to make possible. If you've never wrestled with this before, if, if you've never thought about this difficult question of, of a transformed heart, then I have some good news for you. You're in the right place for it. Because Christian religion, Christian religion is meant to help you recognize your dependence on God. Read verses 9 to 10 with me. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Do you see what Jesus assumes here? Nicodemus' religion was meant to prepare him for the new birth. His religion was meant to prepare him for the new birth because that's what Christian religion does. Some people have a common notion, or you might have heard it said before, that Christianity is really about a relationship and not a religion. Now, friends, I, I tell you this. Jesus says here that true Christian religion helps you into this relationship of dependence. The two are meant to be friends. And what God has joined together, let not men tear asunder. Christian religion and a Christian relationship with God, they work together. Your Christian religion, uh, this is really the heart of all of it. That all of Christian religion calls us, and it calls us into a life of joyful dependence on God. So in an almost ironic way, if you think about it, it is precisely your needfulness and your dependence that qualifies you to receive God's work of rescue. I say that again, it's precisely your needfulness and your dependence that qualifies you to receive God's work of rescue. And now I have to ask, friends, all of your religious practice, if it does not help you to recognize your dependence and your needfulness, if your religious practice does not help you to recognize these things, then what's the point of your religious practice? Are you working hard just to disqualify yourself? Consider today what you will think about as you walk outside of these doors. Consider today how you will wake up tomorrow on a Monday morning and head to work. Will you leave this church and this religious service thinking that you've had just the right dose of God? Just enough, not too much, and now your life begins for yourself? Or will you let your Christian religion do its true work? where you leave this place so keenly aware of your daily need of God and go to Him for help. In fact, if right now, if right now you recognize that there's something in your heart, something more radical that needs to be changed and turned, something that you know needs to be fixed, especially in relation to how you think of God, then ask Him for help right now. Do not tarry any longer. It is a good thing, my friends. I know it's a scary thing, but it is a good thing to cast ourselves entirely upon our God in dependence, for that is what He has come to do. The words we read at church, the prayers we pray, the songs that we sing, all of these religious practices are meant to help us to understand and work out our dependence on God. Isn't this what we sang earlier? No separation from the world. No work I do, no gift I give can cleanse my conscience, cleanse my hands. I cannot cause my soul to live. But Jesus died and rose again. The power of hell is overthrown. My God is merciful to me and merciful in Christ alone. If you're wondering now, okay, born again, but what does that really look like? How, how do I know that I'm born again? You know, there, are, there, are, there are a number of different ways. Let me give you one. Let me give you one sign. You know that you are born again if you have the precious jewel of humility. If you are born again, you will grow in humility, not because humility is this great virtue that you celebrate and want to work hard for, but you will grow in humility because a truly dependent people will learn to be a humble people. 
there, there, there is a cultural narrative and for many there is also a lived experience that the more religious someone gets, the more snobbish they get, the more quick they are to condemn, the more quick they are to rush into judgment, to defend themselves, to think highly of themselves and lowly of another. There, there, there really is this cultural narrative and for many people a real experience. I want to say that in some sense, if your religion is about you improving yourself and you working hard to improve yourself, then, then that actually makes sense. You know, it makes sense for you to think yourself better if your religion is about you improving yourself. But friends, if your Christian religion is about what God has done to save you and save you to the uttermost, then this cannot be the case. Instead, the more religious we get, the more we realize just how much God has saved us and shaped us. So the more religious we get, the more humble we get, the more quickly we admit of our need, the more confidently we can point to our failures, even shameful failures. Because we have tasted and seen that God strengthens and restores the needy. Redemption Hill Church, we are to encourage one another to such a life. Humility, it is the inheritance of all who have been born again. And God has a specific mission for the born-again heart. Second point, Jesus says it, you are born again so that you can believe in me. Look with me to our text to verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Jesus is speaking in Old Testament references that Nicodemus would have understood this serpent in the wilderness language, it is an account from the book of Numbers. I summarize for us. God had been providing for his people's daily needs, but even then his people despised him and rebelled against him, and so his righteous wrath was upon them. They became afflicted by venomous serpents in the desert. But even then, God's mercy stretched forth. As the people confessed their sins, God made a way for them to be saved from their physical death. A figure of a bronze serpent was made and lifted up to a high place so that all who looked upon it and believed in God's means of salvation would not die but live. And here is what Jesus is saying. You also must behold the Son of Man, the Messiah, me, and believe in Him so that you might live. Why is it important that we know this? Well, it's important because it tells us about the sort of people who believe. Let's be clear. The message to behold and believe, it goes out to everyone because everyone is under God's wrath in their sin. But this belief, it really only works for those who recognize that they rightly stand under God's wrath in their rebellion. Only then will you be ready to behold and believe. Those who do not recognize their sickness do not see their need of a doctor. Why else must we know this? Well, we must know this because it contextualizes one of the most famous Bible verses, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The word world can have different meanings in different contexts. Think about it. When Aladdin says to Jasmine on the flying carpet, I can show you the world, he means the world is a big place, it's an interesting place, it's a shining, shimmering, splendid place. When a boy tells his crush, you are my world. I assure you, he's not stressing that she's a big place. He's more so saying that she's an important place. So when it tells us here in, God, in John's Gospel that God loves the world, what does the context tell us? The context tells us that we are meant to be surprised. For the world that God loves is neither a big place nor an important place but a bad place. 
It is a world in moral rebellion against the only holy God, a world that stands under the affliction of death and God's righteous anger. This is why there is a surprising offence to God's love. He loves a world this bad. And His love goes beyond just a nice thought and sentimentality into practical, costly giving. He loves a world this bad that He gave His only Son. Friends, God's work calls you and I today grapple with the costliness of this belief, of, of the belief that we can have. While God was entirely entitled to send His Son into a world so bad, to enforce his sanction and condemnation, he instead gave his son to save and cure our sinful hearts. I recognize it can be a jarring thing to truly believe that you need to be saved. For in many ways, it is a easy, it's an easy and acceptable thing to, to acknowledge that you need God's help. But, but it's really something else to accept that you need God's salvation. Because in order to do so, in order to accept that you need God's salvation, you have to believe that you can never do enough to be good enough to save yourself. You must believe that Jesus Christ alone can count you worthy of standing before the only holy God. There are many today, many people who might even have once called themselves Christian, who sincerely believe that they can be good without God. They recognize virtues of kindness and, and generosity and love. They, they work hard. They work really, really, really hard to practice these virtues. In some sense, many of them work harder than Christians. I, I, I know a lot of these people. I, I work in the charity sector. I see them all the time. I, I, is it really fair some of you might be thinking, is it really fair to call a world bad in this light, to call such people bad? Okay, can you really say that they're so bad that they need salvation? But if you're here and you actually think this way or you know someone who thinks this way, can I just invite you to one major consideration? Consider that our badness is bigger than just behaviour. This is especially relevant for those who work hard at doing good. Um, I mentioned that I work in the charity sector. Of all the sectors that one might work in, you might think that the only place in, in uh, our capitalist world where you can find people of virtue and where angels abound is here, the charity sector. A nice, nice place. And, and right at the back, I see a social worker shaking his head already. You, you, you know, whatever the case is, I, I want to acknowledge that a lot of good happens here, but it is such a revealing place about the condition of our hearts. It really is. You, you see that there really is a measure, a significant measure of self-righteousness that always bubbles up. It naturally arises in the hearts of those who spend their days doing good things. I'm not saying they should stop doing good things. I'm just saying that it's so revealing about the actual condition of our hearts. I speak for myself. I speak for the do-gooders that I know. We are so prone to growing proud in our hearts simply because we are doing good things. I don't have the time to go into all of the details with you, but I can tell you that in the decade that I've spent in this sector, you cannot even begin to imagine the amount of self-interested politics, selfish pride that can motivate the best of actions. I have known these temptations for myself many times too. Even petty vengeances, personal vanity projects, they creep in so easily. Those of us who have spent time here know this to be true. It is so easy to be tempted towards a sense of vainglory and self-righteousness even when we are focused on doing good. And here's the point. Here's the point. Even the best of us, on the best of our days, find that our good deeds are so easily mixed with bad intentions. Our badness is simply far bigger than behaviour. It goes back to our first point. We need new hearts. And maybe you're still not convinced about the severity of our badness. 
truth be told, you don't even have to look at my anecdotal testimony. What you really need to look at is the Son of God given for a world like this, lifted up on a Roman cross. Because when you look at this Jesus raised on a Roman cross, you realize the true extent of sin's severity. Every bitter thought, every evil deed, we see that all of our badness deserves this sort of wrath. We may be poor estimators of our own badness, but God sees things perfectly and He sees things clearly and He sees into the depths of our hearts and He knows that we deserve this wrath. Yet on that cross, God gave up His only Son who willingly took on the wrath that you and I deserve. This only Son was twice lifted up that we would behold Him rightly. The first time He was lifted up was on the cross by sinful men that He would take on our sins. And the second time He was lifted up was in His resurrection that in His life we would take on new life. Friends, this is the good news of the gospel for you and I today. This is the very point of our religious service. We are to behold this lifted up Son of Man, believe in Him, and live. What's stopping you from doing that today? Our concluding verses tell us what the rest of religious, of religious life looks like. For the last time, turn with me in your Bibles to verses 19 to 21. It reads, And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. Friends, we all know what it is like to hide in darkness. No one likes being exposed. No one is comfortable with the shame that it might suggest. Um, if there are young people in this room, you, you know that especially well when, when you've done something wrong and, and there's the threat of it being exposed. If you are slightly older, you know that very well also. You've just gotten better at hiding it. No, no one really says, oh, I've messed up so badly, I, I just can't wait to tell someone about it. No one does that. And, and so we see the words proven true. Not only does a world in rebellion do evil, it loves to hide and it hates the light. Will those who have known Christian religion be different? The start of verse 21 reads, But whoever does what is true comes to the light. Why do Christians come to the light? Do they come to the light so that they can tell people about how good they are? No, read on. But whoever does what is true comes to the light that it may be seen that their works have been done in God. Oh friends, the faith that saves us is the faith that continues to sustain us. The grace that has brought us safe thus far is the grace that will lead us home. We come to the light so that we can tell people about how Jesus has changed our hearts. The man who wrote um, the song Amazing Grace, John Newton, if you know his story, you'll know that he was a famous slave trader. He did terrible things, unconscionable things. And then he was saved and he renounced his business and he renounced his evil ways and, and he, he turned and lived to Christ. But at the end of his days, do you know what he said? What he said represents this coming to the light. At the end of his days, he said, I am not who I want to be. I am not who I ought to be. I am not who I one day, by the grace of God, will be. But I am not who I used to be. And by the grace of God, I am who I am today. That is how Christians come to the light. It can look like bringing forth our good deeds, but acknowledging that they are now possible in a different way. Possible because God's love has reached into our hearts to transform it, that we would have our loves now 
rightly ordered. And then it can also look like coming forward with our shame and our failure. In fact, it must look like coming forward with our shame and our failure because when we bring these things, these difficult things to the light, when we come to Jesus with our shame and our failure, we come to Jesus with all of this brokenness, we show and we tell the world that Jesus is strong enough and kind enough to redeem us. And so to the church called redemption, will you consider today about how you are living in light of your redemption? Will you consider what your coming forward to the light means for each other in encouragement? Will you consider what your coming forward to the light means for a world that is hiding in darkness? Because if you can bring these broken things of your life forward to Jesus, then it means that surely this world can come forward too. In coming to the light, we say, darkness trembles its threatening voice, but light and life has dawned. Helpless sinners now rejoice, now freed of shame's strong bond. Evil darkens and scorns and shames, but Christ, he came to free. All who trust in his great name, even ones as sinful as me. The night is dark and fraught with fear. We look to Christ, he is at hand. He wipes away our tears and fears. Light dwells forever in his kingdom's land. Consider today how you relate to this God of surprising love and amazing grace. Consider today what your religion is doing for you, my friends. Have you been awakened to your dependence on God? If so, that is a wonderful thing. Ask that His Spirit would move in your heart to make you come alive more and more to Jesus Christ. I'm going to invite the band to join me on stage now as we prepare to close in prayer and as we prepare to sing our concluding song, I ask, take the next 30 seconds of silence, think about these things before God. Ask Him for His help. He is gracious and able. He does it in Christ. Father, we are so grateful for the cross of Christ. There we know clearly the depths of our sins. And there we see even more clearly the extent of your love and mercy, even to ones such as us. Lord, we come before you confessing that we need to see this more and more. We need to live our lives daily beside the cross. And we thank you, Lord, that as we strive to live our lives beside the foot of the cross, we look up and we see our Saviour. And we see not just His sacrifice, but the truth that He has risen and risen to a glorious new life. Lord, may that be the case for us. Help us to know what it means to walk in His life and His light. And for all of us who struggle, who doubt, who are unsure, by the power of Your Spirit, make Jesus so glorious in their sights that they too may rejoice in his saving love. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Church, let's rise, let's respond in singing.